Welcome back to NTV. Today we continue the conversation on the mitigation measures that can be taken to face the drought situation and actually prevent the same in the future. Right now we're facing a national disaster that has been declared by the government. We're speaking to Gabriel Rugalema from the Food and Agriculture Organization as well as Jeremiah Nyaga from the World Vision. Uh, and earlier when we were talking about some of the measures and reactions that we're taking, um, I was on to the point of what the organizations do in terms of warning the government and at least supporting the government in giving a response before it gets to national disaster level. What had you done before this particular situation, before we found ourselves here? So thank you, Mark. My colleague Gabriel had really mentioned about the early warning. Yes. I think the, the early warning is there. And maybe before that, I want to go to the first question you had asked. Has government was it prepared? Did it prepare? Did it see the, did it see the wall, uh, early warning signs? So I think what we can say at this point is comparatively to 2011, I think the government responded better. Yes. But the situation, I think, is a bit overwhelming. And I think the other thing, what, what has happened this time in terms of coordination, I think we, ha we have the county steering group that has also been helping at the mm. county level, and I think that has helped the situation. But I think by and by the situation has become a bit o overwhelming, even for the country, and that's why it has become a national disaster. Mm. As World Vision, what have we been doing even before uh, we came to this? We've been continuing with our uh, resilience uh, projects, and one of the things that we've been doing is the, 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 the cash transfer. I suppose we've moved from a situation where we were doing the general food distribution, and right now what we are doing is that we are saying that it is uh, asset creation so that you, you work, then after you work and you create an asset within the community. And some of the assets that we are doing is, for example, can the community do an earth dam? So that when we have shortage of rain around that particular period, uh, we are able to conserve water. Right. So when they do that, we pay them, and at that point, we empower them to make a decision on the kind of food they want to eat. We no longer do the general food distribution. And that, that brings a bit of dignity to them, because you can go to the market and with the money in your pocket, you're able to decide what do I want to purchase in the market. So we have been doing resilience uh, programs uh, in uh, different counties in this nation because currently while Vision, we're in 34 of the 47 counties and okay. we've been doing uh, those activities in the, in the county. Right. It's only that this particular uh, uh, point, we have to uh, move our gear higher and even as an organization, because we do development, we are saying, can we repurpose some of our funds instead of doing the normal development? Because you don't expect people to engage in normal development when actually they are dying out of hunger. As a food and agricultural organization, uh, what advice are you giving to the government? What can actually be implemented to stop this cyclic uh, repeat of the same disaster that is drought? And it's getting worse as the years go by. Uh, thank you, Mark. First of all, let me start with uh, also what FAO has been doing. Uh, our perception of this is uh, something that I call MAT. Monitor the situation consistently, act early, and think beyond the current situation. Mm -hmm. So I'll come to the think beyond the current situation. But in terms of um, um, monitoring, FAO has been monitoring the situation. I just showed you the maps where we look at the forage availability in pastoral areas and then make sure that we uh, pass this information to government to say, hey, here you have a problem. And you have been doing so over Yeah, we have been doing have so. Have they been ignoring this? No, they have been taking it uh, on board. Then but, why are uh, we here? I think we are here because we didn't expect the situation from last year will go into this year and become as big as it has become. Yes, but, but as the you government know, government has been listening. But as you know, scientists yeah. have been saying, you've shown me an article actually that you yeah, uh, that cited just, scientists uh, saying that yeah. it's getting worse yeah. over time. Then uh, are, they, are they just taking a back seat here or, you know, business as usual as soon as the rains come? I think I will say we are learning as we do okay. and doing as we learn. The government doesn't have a magical wand. They have to learn with the situation. As I said at the very beginning, they reacted timely. They reacted with the resources they have. The situation is overwhelming. So in terms of other things, we do resilience programs out there in uh, different uh, counties. We have been doing disease control. You know, this drought is first and foremost a problem of uh, livestock. Yes. There is no water, there is no pasture, and people depend on livestock, that's why you have livelihood crisis. Mm. But essentially it's a livestock problem. So we have been doing disease control and pest control to ensure that even with the drought, some animals can survive 
because they are not uh, already overcome by for those disease. pastoralist yeah. uh, communities what what do you give or what has what are the numbers that we have in terms of the efforts that the government has to either buy the livestock from them before the, it is before they die yeah, and that's what the, I, I wanted to go. The the offtake is the thing is called offtake, where you buy livestock from um, uh, farmers uh, and then either sell it uh, very far away. But what the government is doing now is to slaughter the animals and distribute the meat in those communities. And I found this to be very, very good. First of all, you put money in the pockets of the communities. The second one is you boost nutrition levels of the communities eating uh, this meat and third you reduce pressure on the fragile ecosystem this sounds very good idealistically i'm sure you you saw and you facilitated the trip yeah. that uh, our colleague did yeah. in in marsabit <clears throat> and yeah. uh, he showed the pastoralists who say yes the government has pronounced itself in its plans to buy the livestock but it hasn't reached them in terms of this uh, this particular effort or uh, you know this response what is the reality on the ground away from the pr well, uh, well, I think, uh, like my colleague has said, I think there is that effort, and yes. probably there are some pockets. Probably the government has not reached, but there is a deliberate attempt to do that. But probably the situation is becoming more and more overwhelming, right. and that's yeah, why probably yeah. the government has mm. not reached. But there is mm. definitely a deliberate attempt. And just probably to add something, uh, like uh, what my colleague has said, the other thing uh, we are trying to tell, especially the pastoralist community, the, the who rear livestock, can also reach a place where we can also ensure our livestock. Mm. Because I think the situation where we are reaching is that we are reaching at a point where livestock is dying, and when they die actually they go back and actually the poverty levels go very high because they don't have any other means so we are telling are we able to ensure so that at a particular point in the event they lose their livestock that there's a certain community that is going to come and that makes them to be able to bounce back and be able to become more resilient. And besides ensuring the livestock, some yeah. people have actually suggested uh, either getting into other means of agriculture or, you know, a different methods exactly. of livestock mm. rearing. Yeah, that's excellent, Mark. And that brings us to the think beyond the current situation. Because, um, first of all, drought is changing and is warming. So, indeed, there is need to cut the cycles of this drought or the pain they cause. And one of the things that I thought when I went uh, out there is that the land is dry and bare so we need to make sure that we go into large scale reforestation right. uh, large scale um, receding of the grass so that it protects the soil and also water harvesting that's one two I think we need to go to enhanced destocking because, I mean, we can't do this talking when the problem is already there. These uh, millions of heads of cows are, cause, uh, are contributing to the problem. So we better reduce and keep the numbers where it is optimal and it doesn't cause these big But this problems. is their life, yeah. that they guard with their life. You take it away from them, they but will actually you, take up arms. Now it's a life. But if you make it into a livelihood... Uh, so that the fewer animals they have, the better money they have and better lives they have, they will surely accept. Is there a breakdown in communication to the communities uh, on the ground? Because you have been at work as World Vision, as mm. FAO, with, uh, over the years. What is, what is the missing, missing link here? Well I, don't, to them. well, I don't think it's a breakdown, but I think it's about change of attitude and yeah. it takes time. And culture, it's entrenched. Yeah, yeah. And culture, mm -hmm. it's, it's really deeply entrenched. But we, there are some places we can talk about success stories. We go to a place like Samburu, that, that, that such community is purely a, a pastoralist. Yes. But there's a way now you introduce them to the issue of the crops, you tell them that you can be able to uh, plant drought resistant crops drought tolerant crops and they're able to do that we've seen such situations yeah. there's some part of Turkana that uh, we did an irrigation scheme a place called Molerem and well the other part of Turkana is experiencing uh, drought there they are actually able to harvest because they've started doing irrigation and that is something different for a Turkana person to start doing that but this did not just happen it started a long time ago yeah. and it has mm -hmm. been a journey so yeah. therefore we should not give up let us continue passing the message along and finally we shall see that transformation uh, gentlemen in our in our wrapping up comments here because we're out of time yeah. sadly um what are the priority areas for the government uh, nationally and county level and as well uh to the kenyan who's watching because yeah, yeah. they feel it's easy to <coughs> to blame this on the government mm. and of course at some extent it's beyond them in terms of uh, the climate change that is you know worldwide mm. um but there's something that they can do yeah you've, 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 men you've mentioned uh, reforestation 
Yeah, I will um, just say three quick points. First of all, drought is costly. Every time there is drought, the government has to uh, reprogram huge amount of money like now into fighting um, uh, drought and uh, responding. So I think that only that point should push every Kenyan to be careful and to try. Secondly, and, yeah. Secondly is the investment. Out there, we need large, consistent, multi-year investment, as I said, in receding the bare land, in fencing off so that the land can regenerate, in destocking, and in trying different alternative investment. Right. It could be in industry, it could be in irrigated agriculture, it could be in water harvesting, mm -hmm. something that reduces pressure on the ecosystem. Third, third, thank third. you. All right. Yeah. So thank you, Mark. And I think in wrapping up, I think what I would really uh, want to say concerning this situation, I think drought has been declared a disaster and it will keep coming. But I think what we don't have as, as a government, we don't have a national disaster management policy. I think that discussion has been there, but it has not been finalized. What of this uh, ending drought emergency program that... Mm. Uh, it's a program, but it's not a policy. So okay. it's, it's a program, but not entrenched in a policy. I think that's one thing we are really saying. It, if, if it can be finalized, I think that would, uh, that would, that would be good. There, but right now, I think we should uh, uh, embark on saving lives. But as we save lives, let's think, because we are going to have another drought at another time. But how are we able to get the early warning that we are getting, and how we are we uh, being able to respond in a very coordinated way? I think we should be able to, uh, to manage it. Gentlemen, uh, this yeah. is a discussion that can be uh, well grasped within 15 minutes, but yeah. thank you all the same for the time that you've given us, Jeremiah and Gabriel from FAO and Jeremiah from thank you. World Vision. The work continues, of course, for you, and yeah. we'll be watching what you're doing and as well as the government. And the challenge has been thrown to you as an individual. There's a lot that can be 